who doesn't love free things? Whenever you see that four letter word, you know you've hit the jackpot. Free food, free clothes, free air, and especially free video games. Nowadays, game companies are giving out a lot more free content. We've got Microsoft and Sony giving away monthly games with their subscriptions, which are very hit or miss. What the fuck is this? And then we have the free to play live service games, which usually end up either being really successful or dying a most painful death. But I'll tell you what you don't normally get. A free game already installed on your console. How'd that get in there? This was the case with Astro's Playroom, a completely free platformer introducing you to the PS5 and its controller all whilst taking you on a fun ride with a cute little robot. Whilst you may think that Astro's Playroom is just a glorified tech demo for the PS5, it is so much more than that. It's an enjoyably fun ride through PlayStation's history with colourful levels, adorable characters, and a lot of references. Look my brother in Christ, it is the solid snakey. I clapped, I clapped when I saw it! With a new adventure coming this year, got that shit locked down on pre-order by the way, I thought I'd revisit this charming experience and share to you all why Astro's Playroom is the best free game ever made. Right away, the game puts you in a tutorial section, introducing you to the DualSense controller. It doesn't overstay its welcome and quickly shows you everything you need to know about the controller's features in a very nice easy two minutes. Speaking of the DualSense, I completely forgot that the controller has a blow feature. Sometimes in the game you'll come across this little fan and you have to blow air on your controller to get it to move. It seems like a forgotten feature, and judging by the fact that I haven't seen it in a PS5 game since, it looks like the rest of the industry has as well. After we've completed the tutorial, we then get introduced to the star of the show, Astrobot. He's so cute! Astro is easily PlayStation's new mascot at this point. Move over, Kratos and Nathan Drake. Astro's here to dab his way into the spotlight. He's a cute little guy who makes some adorable facial expressions and sounds, and he's probably the only video game character that I don't cringe at when they floss. And when you're controlling Astro, he handles extremely well. He doesn't feel too stiff or floaty, and it's really easy to get the hang of. That last part also applies to the core gameplay too. The two main buttons you'll be using will be the X and Square buttons. Pressing X allows Astro to jump, whilst holding it activates his Iron Man boots that allow him to hover and cover long distances. Square on the other hand is Astro's action button. Pressing it will allow him to simply just punch enemies, but holding and letting go at the right time will allow him to charge his attack and unleash a spin move, which is quite similar to Crashly Bashly. <laughs> Speaking of the enemies, I'm surprised that there's a lot of variety here. You have your standard enemies that run up to you and just... tap you. But you'll also encounter different variants, like spike enemies that will unleash their spikes if you get too close, electric enemies that can only be damaged with the beams from Astro's hover boots, and flying enemies that will try and crush you, leaving them open to be taken down. Each enemy can mostly be taken down in one hit. However, you'll sometimes encounter enemies with open wires. You'll have to wait for them to do their attack first, and then hold the square button and pull to defeat them. Whilst the enemies have a lot of variety, I will say that they are a bit too easy. During my playthrough, I only died to these guys when I was either getting careless, or when they caught me off guard. I know with a game like this, difficulty isn't the biggest selling point, but it would still be nice to have some challenge, instead of it feeling like a massive walk in the park. Let's go, too easy dude, give me that crown! But what about the levels themselves? How do they work? Well, there's four levels in total, with each one being named and based on a particular piece of the PS5's technology. For example, SSD Speedway is a futuristic space setting with flying cars zooming past and rockets shooting up into space. Makes sense, SSDs are fast. Cooling Springs puts you on a beach to start with, but as you carry on, it transitions to an icy winter wonderland. Again, it makes sense, it's based on the fan, and fans keep things cool. The other two, however, I'll admit I'm a bit stuck on. Memory Meadow, I'm assuming, is about the RAM, but why does it have muddy terrains and leaf blower clouds? Same thing for GPU Jungle. How does the jungle relate to the GPU? I've got nothing, but it does have a really catchy song playing throughout. Now each one of these levels have four stages, two of these being the standard gameplay we've been through already, and the other featuring different kinds of suits. Each suit feels unique from the other, and will mostly involve you using the controller's features rather than relying on the stick and buttons. For example, in Cooling Springs, you use this clapped looking spring suit. You'll use a combination of the adaptive triggers to move the suit, 
and the motion controls to point it in the direction you want it to go. Or in Memory Meadows where you get a ball suit and you have to use a touchpad to move and steer. I know without a doubt that a few people may dislike these sections, and just see them as nothing more than gimmicks. And I can see why they may think that. I mean, they're not my favourite parts of the game, but I think it fits in with it nicely. I mean, this entire game is designed to show off the DualSense controller and what it can do. What do you think was going to happen? So, you'll punch, jump and run until you finally get to the end of the level. And what do you get when you reach the finish line? Pure nostalgia. At the end of each level, you get rewarded with one of the four PlayStation consoles, with each one of them being interactable, and even the backgrounds of the levels looking like their home menus. The PS2 one hit the hardest for me, like, oh my god, that startup sound just, mmm, so many memories. But that isn't all that you can collect. Each of the levels have puzzle pieces and artifacts. Some of these will be out in the open, and some in secret areas you'll have to find. Artifacts are especially a delight to find. Some of these I can completely forgot existed, like the PS1 multi-tap, the buzz controllers, and especially the SingStar microphone. Each puzzle piece or artifact you collect goes straight into the PlayStation Labo. In the Labo you can see each one of these up close in more detail, and interact with them to show you how they worked. Some of them also have little easter eggs too, like for example if you hit the power button on each of the consoles, you can hear their startup music. Or that if you hit the PlayStation icon on the PS2, it switches. This was actually a feature on the PS2 where you could change the logo depending if the console is stood up or laid on its side. There's a lot of nice attention attention to detail with these. The puzzle pieces you collect unlock this super cool wall art that shows you the history of PlayStation, and there's a vending machine that you can spend your coins on to unlock more artifacts, puzzle pieces, and other bots that show up in the labo. But there's one other thing we haven't talked about that you can find in the levels, and that is the abundance of cameos. Scattered over all of the stages are appearances from a number of characters that appeared in PlayStation games. Some are popular characters that anyone could recognise, such as Dad and Boy, the first strand type game ever made, David Cage's Magnum Opus, Depression the video game, Nuts and Bolts, Smash Brandy's Cooch, Metal Animals, Dude Raider, the most overhyped game that turned out to be a disappointment on release ever made, and PlayStation's Milk Machine. I'm going to milk it for everything I can. But there are some cameos from the more obscure franchises, ones that only die-hard PlayStation fanboys will point and clap at for recognising. Classics such as Monkey Catch, Envelope Head, this one that I don't like but everyone else loves, this... whatever the hell this is, it's Ridge Racer! Ridge Racer! The two shooty games, Force Feed in the game, Rocket Raccoon's brother, and the paintbrush vandal. I did notice that a few PlayStation characters weren't absent in the game, like no Spyro the Dragon, this doesn't count, or Sweet Tooth from Twisted Metal. What, could you guys not get the rights or something? Even though some are absent, there's roughly around 60 cameos in total, so I'd say that's a good amount. But there's one important cameo that we haven't talked about yet. If you head to the hub's lower level, you'll find this mysterious looking box. And each time a level is complete, one of the four PlayStation icons will appear on it. Complete all four levels and the box opens, giving you access to the final level of the game. And once you step inside the box, you get transported all the way back to 1994. You'll find yourself in a dark room with nothing but a PS1 and a very old looking TV. You walk all the way up to the PS1, give it a quick little love tap, and then see this. Hmm, interesting. After climbing some stairs, which are also made out of PS1 memory cards by the way, you make your way to this platform when, hang on a second, it's just giving me two hearts. Well, this is new, the game hasn't done this yet, what's going on? Okay, I did not expect that. If you're like me when I first played this game, I bet you're wondering why a blocky T-Rex has just randomly appeared in the game. Well, allow me to educate you. Back when the PS1 was released, it came with a demo disc allowing you to play snippets of PS1 games but it also came with two tech demos. One of these was of a manta ray in the ocean. It was pretty calming to look at, unless you put the creepy music on.
But the most memorable of the two was the T-Rex demo. The T-Rex demo allowed you to look at the model, zoom in, and even interact with him. I'm not exactly sure why it's an iconic PlayStation moment. I think it largely has to do with the graphics. At the time, we hadn't seen anything like this come out, let alone from video games, and it was a big step in the right direction for both the industry and technology as a whole. Or it could be the dark, funky music. How is the music for the T-Rex less creepy than the music for the Manta Ray? Because of Rex's groundbreaking graphics, he is now an iconic part of PlayStation history. But here, he's the final boss of the game. The boss fight is a solid 5 out of 10 at best. All you have to do is dodge his attacks and then whack him in the eye when there's an opening. I can count about 50 plus games that have the same kind of boss fight. I'll give him this, his attacks are varied. He tries to hit you with his tail, chomp down on you with his teeth, and fire discs at you from his mouth. But he's no match for Astro and he's easily taken down. And that's Astro's Playroom, a really fun game that had no right- OH SHIT! RUN ASTRO GET THE FUCKING STAIRS HE'S GONNA GET YOU! The second wave is a little bit harder, but only by maybe a point or two. You still dodge the same attacks and a few new ones, but this time you gotta throw trophies to weaken him so you can give him some free eye surgery. After beating both of his eyes and pulling his tongue, fucking hell this dude is suffering here, Jesus Astro. Astro celebrates his victory and then proceeds to beat up the developers names. Yeah, take that Kenneth CM Young, that's what you get for having two initials. And to cap everything off we get the final few artifacts completing the game, and all I can say is... They fucking cooked with this one. Whilst it's not the longest game in the world, I beat in about three hours. And it does verge on the easy side a bit too much. Its charm and love for the PlayStation brand outweighs its flaws in spades. Team Asobi really did not have to go hard with this game. They could have just given us a 30 minute tech demo and called it a day. But instead, they went above and beyond and gave us a cute, fun and charming experience all wrapped up into one amazing package. And I'm not the only one that thinks this. Just go and look online and you'll see hundreds of posts and comments praising this game and how well done it is. I'm surprised that Xbox or Nintendo hasn't tried something like this. Can you imagine a nostalgia filled Nintendo title with decades worth of cameos and references? Nintendo, why aren't you taking notes? This is a money making gold mine right here. Just remember to give me a share, yeah? Help a brother out, I need to pay my rent. Astro's Playroom is a really fun and well thought out game that perfectly introduces gamers to not just the PS5, but PlayStation as a whole. It deserves all of the love and attention it has received. And it looks like all of Team Asobi's hard work has paid off, as Astro will be getting his first full game this year. He'll be back with more levels and boss fights, more collectibles, stuff with nostalgia, and cameos from PlayStation characters that you can find and how fucking many? Oh wow, this is surely gonna be a great ride. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Any second now. It's gonna be here uh, soon. Mmm, <laughs>